Hey everyone, have you ever tried to learn how to code but got stuck? In my new Private Fan programming class, we're going to break that loop. This course is primarily focused on people who are complete beginners, so don't worry if you don't have any background. This course is different than other courses because we're going to teach you to think like a programmer and solve problems like a robot. So let's get started. Hi everyone. So last, the last video we talked about the quadratic formula, the actual solution, and created a function that will return the results, the two roots, just putting in A, B, and C. Although this is an alternative to what we've been learning this whole time of making our own function that will, or our own code that will do this for us, this kind of introduces us to functions and allows us to use the quadratic formula even if we don't want to remember this hideous long equation. We can now just use quadratic function, pass in any values for A, B, and C, and it will return some values to us that are the actual roots. Now I'm going to set these a little bit differently so that we get actual positive roots. So here we have two real roots. When we put in one, one, and one, it actually still worked, but it spits out an imaginary number. So this isn't something we really want to deal with right now. But as I mentioned before, it could be imaginary if there's a negative number in this square root. Don't really worry about it. Just know that it will still give us the correct solutions, even if there are no real roots, as I mentioned before. Okay, so now the last thing I wanted to talk about is just cleaning up some of this code and making this a little bit easier for us to use. So there's a couple of things here that we did that I feel like we could have done in a bit of a smarter way, and I wanted to track back and talk about that. Now, what this is known as is called refactoring. And when we refactor code, we're going to have the same output. It's going to produce the same result, and it's going to work the same exact way. We're just going to change some of the some of the way that the code is written, either to make it easier for other people to use and understand, or to just clean up and make it simpler overall. There is a sense of good and bad code in terms of quality, even if it's doing the same thing. So we're going to want to go back and make sure that this is easier to understand for everyone involved. The first thing I'm going to talk about is this whole hours of math uh, calculation, right? So this got a bit confusing because every time we wanted to change the increment, so if we were going up by, remember at the beginning, we were going up by 1 over 10, and uh, we were going from 0 to 100, in, um, then we divided it by 10, and now we're going between 0 and 10 in increments of 1 over 10. So this whole thing got a bit confusing because every time we wanted to change this number, we had to change this number too. So this might be a good, whenever you're in a situation like that where you're finding things are related to each other in a bit of a complicated way, you might want to start putting things into variables and uh, putting it in a more easier to understand way for you, right? So rather than talking about increments and the number of integers I have to get to that increment, I think what I would rather talk about, and I'm going to put this up here, is the actual start value and the actual end value, right? So what I mean here is in this case, the actual end value is 10, right? While I'm looping between between 0 and 100, because I divide them all by 10, the actual last value I want is 10, right? A good way that I usually think about it is what do I want to put in? What do I want to define? And then have the code morph a little bit so that it fits my expectations rather than me trying to make the code work correctly for the way that the code is written, right? I wanted to start at 0, I wanted to end at 10, and then I wanted the increment to be 0.1. So this is what this has done previously for us. But instead of setting 10 and 101, I want to just set my start value, my end value, and my increment. Okay, so the way that I'm going to do this is if I divide the start value and end value by the increment, I'm actually going to get these two numbers, right? And I could show you this because here, these two numbers are defined in terms of slices of one, right? Now you can imagine, instead of using a slice of 1, I'm using a slice of 1 tenth, right? In order to get the number of slices, I need to divide by that number, right? So instead of doing 10 in slivers of 1, in which case there would be uh, 10 numbers I'd have to iterate over, I'm going to do it in terms of 0.1, and then there's going to be 100 values for me to iterate over, right? So that's the approach that I'm going to take. Now I'm going to also have to add because it's going to have to end in this value. Okay, so let's start changing things. So if instead I wanted to have increments of 0 0.01, I would need 1,001, right? And if instead I needed 0 0.001, I would need 10,001. So this has been what we've been doing. I just wanted to put it a bit in a logical format so that we won't have to keep changing these both every time. I could just change one value and it will work correctly. I'm going to call this range start value and range end value. 
And this is gonna be the numbers that I'm gonna actually pass into the range here. And we're gonna just take this start value and divide, do exactly what we did up here, right? So we're gonna take the start value and divide it by 0 0.001. And then I'm gonna take the end value here and divide it by 0 0.001 and add one, right? So this would be in increments of 0 0.001, but I already am setting my increment here, right? This is the value I want it to be. So I'm gonna set this specifically. So this is gonna be this over increment, this over increment. Okay, so I need to do this for the start value as well, because while I'm starting at zero here, if I was starting at one instead, I would actually wanna do the same exact thing. So if I wanted to start at one, I would wanna do something like this and start at a thousand, right? Because there's a thousand values between zero and one in increments of 0 0.001, right? Okay, I wouldn't add the one because it's inclusive on the, the left side and not on the right, but that's where this is all coming from. But really at the end of the day, I just want things to be in terms of start value, end value, and increment, so I don't have to think about this anymore because I find this to be complicated. So the way I do that is now I'm going to change the, these values to start, range start value, and range end value. So now these, are going to be going up by between these two values. And then hours of math, instead of dividing it by 10, I'm gonna multiply it by the increment, right? So before it, here was 0.1, but if it was 0 0.01, it would change that way. So that's the first thing I'm gonna do. And the reason, again, the reason I'm doing this, so everything here should work very similarly to the way that it did before. Now, here's what comes up when I try this type error. Float object cannot be interpreted as an integer. So the problem here is that floats and integers are treated separately or differently in Python. If you look at the type of one, that's gonna be an integer. But if you did type of 1.1, that's a float. And actually, even if you did type of 1.0, that's a float. So floats are decimal numbers and integers are integers with no decimal on them. And they're treated differently in Python. And basically what this is saying is that in range, you need to have integers. So if we look at range start value and range end value, so range start value is 0.0, .0 and range end value is 101.0. These are integers, but because they have a decimal, it's complaining about it and saying, hey, this is a float of decimal value rather than an integer value. So how do we change this? It's actually quite easy. There's a function we can use called int that will take in a float value and make it into an integer value for us. So we're just gonna use this and wrap these two values around it. And when we run, this will actually work. And it gives us the same results that it did before when we were looking at increments of 0.1. Now, instead of having to change these values every time, these calculations are gonna be done for me in terms of variables, and I can focus on the increments. So if I wanna do increments of 0 0.00001, which means I'm gonna have that much precision in my estimate, I'm gonna run it and now it's all I have to change. I don't have to change anything about the end values or the start values and it's able to calculate it to that number of decimal places. Consequently, if I wanted to start instead at negative 10 and go to 10, I could do that just by changing this value, not having to change anything else or have it in terms of the increment. So this kind of makes things a lot more flexible and easier for me to handle. Before I kept having to change two numbers, now I could just change one number at a time and make it more in terms of how I think, not as much of how the computer thinks about it. Okay, again, so now we have these range start values, range end values, and it's going to go in the range. Now it's a couple of other things that we could do. Well, uh, first off, we had, we created a function in the last video. Now there's a couple of things here we might wanna make into functions. There's two that I'm gonna mention. One is fun, which is calculates the fun from the hours of math. This is something we've been using the entire time, but really this should be a function too. And the second is this big ugly thing here, which was used, if you remember, to determine if there were different or same signs between two numbers. So let's make functions for both of those because I think that's the cleanest way of handling this. So I'm gonna define a function. I'm gonna say fun from hours of math. And it's going to take in, the argument is gonna be hours of math. Okay, now I can use hours of math throughout this function and it will know what it is. It's whatever the user passed into the function. So when I call the function later, it's gonna be whatever I pass into it. And I'm just going to copy and paste this here. This whole line, fun, and that's only one indent. So fun is equal to hours of math squared minus six times hours of math plus seven over four. And I'm gonna return fun. Okay, now I'm going to go here and I'm gonna replace this with fun from 
hours of math, and I'm going to put in hours of math, which was calculated here, right? So this is an actual value, and I'm passing this in to this function, which is going to calculate from here, right? Didn't, I wouldn't have to name it hours of math if I didn't want to, right? This is just a coincidence that this happened this way, but I could really name this whatever I wanted. Okay, so I'm going to do it this way, and it works exactly the same way. It's able to calculate it using this function instead. Just to reiterate, if I do fun from hours of math and put in a number now, it's going to calculate it for me. So now I don't need to keep what I was doing up here was I kept on calculating it myself. If you remember earlier on using this function now, I could just keep on putting in a bunch of numbers and it will just tell me what the correct uh, answer is for this particular value. Oop, I missed the number there, but in general principle, right? Okay, so now I've done this for this function and there's one more function I would like to do this for, which is this guy. So this is actually going to have two arguments and I'm going to define has different signs and I'm going to say number one, number two. So the arguments are two numbers. I'm going to try to figure out do they have different signs. So I'm going to say is first positive is equal to absolute value of number one equal to number one. So this checks if the first number is positive. If you remember, this is how we were doing this is second positive is the same thing but for number two so absolute value of number two is equal to number two okay so absolute value of number two is equal to number two will tell us if the second number is positive and then what we're going to return is whether these two things are equal right or rather if they're not equal to each other so this is really what we did here i just wanted to simplify it a little bit so we could understand so Basically, if the first is positive and the second is positive, then this will return false. If the first is negative and the second is negative, this will return false. But if you have any of the op other situations, positive, negative, or negative, positive, it's going to return true, which is what has different signs should return, right? So this is now an, a second function that we have, and this makes our life a lot easier again. So we could take two has different signs, one, negative one, and it's going to return true for if they have different signs and false if they have the same side. It is awesome, right? So now we don't have to use this big ugly line of code in here. We can just write has different signs, fun and last value. So let's try that out. Has different signs, fun, last value. And that's going to work for us, right? Basically, it's going to check whether it has different signs using this function. And now we can focus more on what we're doing. So this kind of just is cleaning up. It does the same exact thing that it was doing before, but it just cleans things up. Now we can even go a step further and take this. We're, we're using the same code here. So we can even make our own is positive function that takes in a number and it will return if absolute value of the number is equal to num number. So not number one, sorry, number is equal to number. And now we can just do, we can just set this equal to is positive number one, and then is positive number two. Okay, so first off, you can see how useful functions are, right? Now we can say is positive three, that's gonna come true, is positive negative four, it's gonna return false. I just want to mention that there is a bit of a sketchy thing that goes on if you have zero here. So this isn't exactly accurate. Zero is neither positive nor negative. It's not going to work every time. This is the general idea. So now we're able to separate these things out into functions that handle things that are on their own. And now we don't have to think about like, how do we figure out if a number is positive or how do we figure out if they have different signs? Because this logic was a little bit complicated. It made sense when we first did it, but after we come back a few times, we might be like, hey, what's that all about? So this is how we would go about doing this with functions. Okay, great. So that's all we have for this. We're going to do one more thing, which is one final the in one of the assignments, we're going to create make this whole thing into a function and use that as a way of solving this for exact exactly for A, B and C in a similar way to up here. But we're going to leave that to an assignment. Mm -hmm.